So I've spoken a little about the Reconstruction Era amendments uh, and then has pointed out a period of significant conservatism uh, in the courts, particularly the federal courts in the United States, during which uh, the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment uh, came to be uh, interpreted to apply to corporations, essentially defining corporations as individuals and giving them the protections of the Due Process Clause. So uh, their uh, life and liberty cannot be uh, infringed upon by excessive state or federal regulation uh, of those uh, corporate entities. So uh, constitutional conservatism uses uh, the 14th Amendment not to uh, protect the civil rights of African Americans, which uh, are being violated quite consistently in the late 19th century as the South is becoming more segregated. Most of the rest of the country was pretty segregated too. Uh, but instead, that due process clause is being used to uh, protect companies from the regulation by states or the federal government of, for example, uh, workplace conditions. Uh, and one of the classic uh, examples, perhaps the classic example of that constitutional conservatism position being overcome uh, is the 1908 uh, Muller versus Oregon case. And I'll just say a little bit ab about that before I go into the amendments of the Progressive Era. 1908, Louis Brandeis, uh, who had uh, the, the personal story of Louis Brandeis is quite incredible. He'd gone, had no formal college undergraduate education. He'd had some very good tutors. Uh, he'd just gone straight to Harvard Law School uh, at, uh, what, age 19? roundabout, and uh, he graduates in a single year. Law school programs at Harvard then were two years, right? So uh, it depended on the school. They, yeah. They switched around. Right. But he, he seems to have done it in about half the generally uh, uh, accepted time for matriculation and breaks virtually every record on the academic books at, at Harvard and is trained to be a corporate lawyer. And quite soon after uh, beginning a career as a corporate lawyer, Louis Brandeis has this uh, moment of awakening where he uh, says that it seems to him that the corporations don't need much in the way of protection, uh, but that ordinary people do, and he becomes the people's lawyer. And in 1908, the state of Oregon hires Louis Brandeis, who has gained tremendous fame uh, earlier in the century in helping to break up the Northern Securities Company, which was the I think the second largest uh, company in the United States at the time. Uh, the state of Oregon hires Louis Brandeis to help uphold a 10-hour law for women in the workplace. Women could not be uh, uh, made to work more than 10 hours a day. And Louis Brandeis will successfully uphold this law, not through the presentation of, of precedent, because there are not any significant precedents. The federal courts are striking down these kinds of regulatory laws, uh, not because of precedent, but through the use of evidence. He presents uh, a mass of statistics to support the argument that women should not work more than 10 hours a day, uh, including uh, increased rates of accident on the job, increased rates of, of uh, stillbirths, uh, among pregnant women working long hours, and the Supreme Court is uh, convinced by uh, his uh, testimony, and the state of Oregon's uh, uh, law restricting uh, women's work or companies to only uh, having women work 10 hours a day, that's upheld. Uh, and it's a, a truly major uh, change in, in American law. Anyway, that happens in 1908. And the story I'm going to focus on now is the story of what happens between 1913 uh, and 1920. So, you know, wh what do we make of the Progressive Era amendments? The first two of which, right, the 16th and 17th, are passed in the first half of 1913. And then the 18th and 19th are passed within 19 months of each other uh, between January 1919 and August 1920. Uh, what do we make of those four amendments? What on earth do the power to collect income tax, the direct election of senators, prohibition, and women's suffrage have in common? Well, on one level, not much at all. But on another level, 
you can argue that these four changes to the Constitution, three of which would be enduring, those changes to the Constitution are very much connected to a movement that was very powerful, but also very broad and sometimes not very unified uh, in the uh, early 20th century. We have a sense of the Reconstruction era, right? Things spring to mind when, when we're, we're asked about Reconstruction, we understand it's the period after uh, the Civil War, the efforts to bring the South back into the nation under new conditions. Uh, when we're asked about the Gilded Age, we, we have a sense of that in part from Mark Twain and Dudley Warner's book, The Gilded Age, uh, but we have a sense of the growth of corporations, the growth of industry, uh, immigration, uh, urbanization, uh, and the, the, some of the, the side effects that accompanied that rapid growth. Uh, we have a sense of the 1920s and 30s, I mean, very different decades, but I think we have pretty good uh, kind of general uh, senses of, of those decades. The progressive era, though, you know, when you, I, I teach a course called the progressive era, and I make sure to put a date range in and to advertise the course with an emphasis on the incredible personalities like uh, Theodore Roosevelt and Mother Jones and Woodrow Wilson, uh, Booker T. Washington and W. B. E. B. Du Bois and Jane Addams and on and on. The number of incredible characters uh, in this period. Because to just say, I'm going to do a course on the progressive era, they're, they're not going to be uh, banging down the doors to get in. <laughs> Historians have had trouble making sense of the progressive era. Students have had trouble making sense of what historians have had to say about the Progressive Era. And I want to try in a nutshell and give it a sense of unity and coherence for you. In the late 19th century, the United States experienced rapid, tremendously rapid urbanization, industrialization, and immigration. The rates of change were astonishing. The United States went from being a middle of the pack industrializing nation to being the world leader. It went from being a, a pretty behind the curve urbanizing nation to being an urban leader, but one that was trying desperately to keep up with the needs, including sanitary needs, uh, of its growing urban populations. And the rates of immigration into the United States uh, in the late 19th century were very, very high. How do you address all of those changes? Um, well, a movement developed in part because of those late 19th century ideas. Lester Frank Ward talking about reform Darwinism, right? that society should evolve to that point where it's able to meet the needs of those whose needs are greatest. Walter Rauschenbusch arguing that the role of the Christian minister should be to bring the kingdom of heaven to earth. And Walter Rausch and Bush would go and talk with factory owners and say, you think this is how Jesus would treat his workers? Uh, perhaps you should treat them in a more Christian fashion. Louis Brandeis and his work in the Muller versus Oregon case and other cases, uh, those efforts were building a foundation for what became known as progressive reform. But there was another foundation that was vitally important was a foundation of optimism. The idea that society could change for the better. You think about those theories, reform Darwinism, the social gospel, and legal pragmatism, and they're all based on the idea that society needs to change. They're all part of what you could call an ideology of discontent, the belief that society is not as good as it should be. But they're also based on the belief that society can, can become much better than it is. Walter Rausch and Bush used the phrase, bringing the kingdom of heaven to earth. That should be the goal of Christian reformers. So an incredible optimism, a sense that if you could get more people aware of what was going on and get more people involved in the political process, you could improve democracy in America. So if you step back from the progressive era and all its confusing uh, kind of sub-movements, you could really bring it all down to, I think, three principles. First, progressive reformers wanted to humanize industrial capitalism. They, wanted to, they, they didn't want to get rid of industrial capitalism. They wanted to reform American capitalism, uh, to humanize it, to make conditions a little better for working people, both living and working conditions. 
Second, most progressive reformers wanted to make American democracy less corrupt and more democratic. One of the reasons the presidency was doing so poorly in the late 19th century was that the, the reputation for corruption, right? The Grant administration had uh, not done terribly well in that regard. Uh, but making American politics less corrupt uh, and more democratic, more receptive to the voices of, of a larger public. But there was a third factor behind the reforms of the early 20th century. And it's a, a harder factor to, to define. Um, it's got a moral tone to it. Uh, it's got uh, uh, a uh, kind of there's certainly a, a Christian uh, tone to it, um, but not always. Um, it's important to remember that for all of those desires to humanize industrial capitalism and to make American politics less corrupt and more democratic, many progressive reformers were not terribly expansive in their views of race. A lot of reformers who called themselves progressives supported the restriction of immigration and they supported immigration restriction because they felt that too many people coming into the country were not white Anglo-Saxon Protestants. They were Southern and Eastern Europeans. They were of peasant stock. They were more likely to be Catholic or Jewish. They were viewed as less assimilable. And in the late 19th and even in the very early 20th century, it's pretty accurate to conclude that Southern and Eastern Europeans, Italians, uh, Slavs, Russians, were not actually considered to be white people by uh, the white American Protestant mainstream. Immigration efforts were carried on, immigration restriction efforts carried on throughout the early 20th century and finally achieved their first success, really significant success in 1917 when over the veto of Woodrow Wilson uh, a literacy test was passed to ensure not that immigrants were literate in English, it was expected that, that that would be too much to ask, but that they were literate in a language. Um, but the real successes for immigration restriction come in 1921 and 1924. The Emergency Immigration Act and the National Origins Quota Act. And we tend to think of those as elements of the 1920s, and they are elements of the 1920s, but they come after a groundswell for more than three decades for restriction of immigration, a groundswell that begins in 1882 with the Chinese Exclusion Act, which is renewed in uh, 1892 and then in 1902 is made uh, permanent and then expanded to all Asians in the 1924 law. Uh, but the 1920s immigration legislation is, imposes quotas in an effort to reduce the number of immigrants from Southern and Eastern Europe. I don't know if you're aware, but in 1924, the census that's used to determine the size of the quotas is not the most recently available census of 1920. They actually use the census of 1890 to determine what the quotas should be because then the numbers of Southern and Eastern European immigrants were lower. Anyhow, there is a racial uh, element to uh, progressivism as well. Immigration restrictionists often called themselves progressives. Eugenicists, those who subscribe to eugenic pseudoscience uh, on their brightest, most humane days, uh, simply focused on the selective breeding of white Anglo-Saxon Protestants to improve that race. On their less good days, they talked about the uh, segregation and sterilization of all those who were mentally uh, challenged, who were deemed morally impure, prostitutes, uh, or who were deemed to have criminal proclivities. Uh, in a book that's about to, uh, it's going to be a year or two before it comes out, um, a uh, literature person, a literary historian, is going to make the argument that Tom Joad in The Grapes of Wrath, John Steinbeck's uh, uh, incredible novel, uh, Tom Joad was actually sterilized uh, at the McAllister prison um, before being released, and Steinbeck provides all kinds of subtle hints of that. Anyway, um, so there, there is a, a, a kind of moralistic and also often uh, quite 
racialized element of progressive reform that says that uh, uh, there are uh, people who need to have the culture taken out of them uh, and replaced with American uh, culture. So there are a range of strands to uh, those um, progressive era reform impulses. So when we understand those strands, we can better understand the amendments, and I'm going to run through them in, in, in rapid pace. The 16th Amendment right, provides the income tax, and it's, well, the word graduated doesn't appear in the amendment, right? But graduated was the assumption that people had. If the government has the power to tax income, it has the power to determine uh, the rates. And part of the impulse behind the 16th Amendment, the income tax amendment, was the notion that the tariff was a tax on consumers. Placing a tax on foreign goods coming into the country to protect American manufacturers was a tax on consumers. And that didn't seem fair. And by 1913, a significant majority of the public was well behind the idea that a graduated income tax would redress that imbalance of consumers paying taxes because of tariffs. Now, those with greater wealth uh, whose wealth was being protected by tariffs would pay uh, taxes uh, at a higher level. So in a sense, it was a kind of redress of the tariff. That's a very, very important part of it. Theodore Roosevelt was on board with it as well by about 1908, as well as with inheritance taxes. He felt that those were appropriate taxes. Uh, now, the rates of taxation, bear in mind, are pretty low to begin with. 1913, the tax began at 1% of income over $20,000. Most people did not have income of over $20,000. And it graduated to 7% on incomes over half a million dollars. Uh, the Revenue Act of 1916, passed during World War I, uh, would raise the top rate to 15%, uh, applicable only to incomes over two million. So the 16th Amendment can be viewed as part of the uh, humanizing of industrial capitalism, redressing the imbalance of the tariff. The 17th Amendment stemmed from the notion that if you let people decide, they'll make wise decisions. And they were not able to directly elect their own senators. There had been a groundswell of uh, re reform efforts to try and expand democracy through the initiative, the referendum, and the recall to give ordinary people more voice in politics, the ability to recall officials who were not serving their needs. So the uh, 17th Amendment can be viewed very clearly as part of that effort to make American politics less corrupt and more democratic. The uh, 18th uh, Amendment, uh, I would venture to you, would not have passed without those racial tensions I talked about, uh, without the emphasis on Greek and Italian winos, Russian, uh, and Eastern European vodka swillers, German uh, beer drinkers. Those stereotypes were deeply ingrained in American culture, along with the stereotype of the African-American male who raped white women in the South when he was inebriated. Those racial arguments were used in the South to support prohibition, uh, and the campaign against German brewers during World War I was as big a part of the prohibition movement as was the notion of conserving uh, grain for food. So I would suggest to you that uh, in uh, a more culturally divided moment in time, the 18th Amendment wouldn't have passed, and that in a more culturally uh, less divided time, 1933, that amendment was uh, repealed. And then finally, uh, the uh, 19th uh, Amendment, well, this is a fascinating moment in American history. Right? Women in New Zealand gained the franchise in 1893. Women in parts of Australia were voting by 1902, in all of Australia by 1911. Finland, Russia, and Norway, well ahead of the United States, all gained the suffrage in the first decade of the century. Polish women were voting by 1917. Canadian women, except in Quebec, by 1918. Right? German women by 1919. But in the United Kingdom, women didn't get the vote until 1928. French women don't get it until 1944. Women in Switzerland, 1971. 
few of the other countries, Brazil, 32, and then Argentina, Mexico, Japan, and China, all in 1947. What is clear is that when it came to women's suffrage, the West was well ahead of the North and the South, uh, but the US was not well ahead of the nation. Uh, women's suffrage comes to Wyoming Territory, then Utah Territory, Colorado, Idaho, Washington, California, Arizona, Kansas, Oregon, Montana, all by 1914. New York is uh, the only state outside the West of significance that has suffrage prior to then, and that's 1913, and then Illinois in 1917. Women's suffrage is very much a, a Western movement, and to some degree, all four of those amendments, 16th, 17th, 18th, and 19th, show the power of the South and the West to affect legislation. It's a period when the Democratic Party controls the White House and generally controls Congress too. So, you know, what's the takeaway from this? And I've run over, so I'll try and, I'll try and abbreviate the takeaway as much as I can. Uh, three out of four is uh, in baseball, just stunning. <laughs> but when it comes to amendments to the Constitution, any one that doesn't work out uh, will always be remembered. Mm. So the progressive era should be remembered for three amendments that have fundamentally expanded American political democracy uh, to women and provided for the direct election of senators. Uh, and in addition, uh, have sought, that was the original intention, to redress an economic imbalance. Uh, whether one likes that or not, that was the sentiment at the time. And flat tax advocates today should look at the rhetoric of the Gilded Age because the, the rhetoric of the Gilded Age was much the same as the rhetoric of the flat tax today. And you don't need a constitutional amendment to get rid of a graduated income tax. The Constitution doesn't say anything about a graduated income tax. It's just assumed. What you would need is a groundswell of public support for a flat tax. And I think that would probably be harder to, to develop. Uh, but one didn't go well. And it's maybe the lesson of the 18th Amendment that becomes the biggest takeaway from the progressive era, that we need to think very carefully, uh, even in times of war, about whether we want to amend uh, our constitution uh, in the heat of the moment. Uh, because when we do, and then have to amend it back again just under 15 years later, it doesn't look like a wise process of, of constitutional change. Let me finish up on that note. And Freedom 101 is made possible by generous support from the University of Oklahoma Alumni Association. Freedom 101 is a program of the Institute for the American Constitutional Heritage at the University of Oklahoma. For more videos and podcasts, visit freedom.ou.edu.